My prayer for you is that as we sing songs like that, where we are proclaiming with our mouth that there is no one higher, there is no one greater than God, my prayer is that that is something that is really resonating as true in your life. That there is no one higher than God, that there is no one more valuable than God, that there's no one bigger than God. Uh, that those aren't just words for you. And we are glad that you guys are here today. I'm going to be in Micah in the Old Testament. I'm going to be in Micah chapter 5 here in just a minute. I'm going to jump around to a couple of different places. So if you're a note taker today, it may be easier for you just to jot these things down and then come back to them later. Here's what we have on tap today as we're in our second sermon on the Advent, second sermon on the Advent, the coming of Christ. And here is what we have on tap today. Our theology is this, Jesus is the shepherd and the king. Jesus is the shepherd and the king. Our application today is this, find peace and security in Christ. Find peace and security in Christ. And our prayer today is, God, we thank you for Jesus, who has shown in the darkness, comforted us like a shepherd, and led us like a king. If you're wondering, how do I talk about this with my younger children at home? What's the family focus today? Family focus is this, Jesus is shepherd and king. Now, I grew up in church. I've been in church my entire life. When I was really young, uh, the church that I went to, we went Sunday mornings. We went Sunday nights. We went to kind of a fundamentalist Baptist church. You know, you'd wear the suit and the tie or whatever. And uh, I was super proud of my tie back then. And uh, we, you wore the same thing basically Sunday night that you did Sunday morning. We went to Wednesday night church. And then we even did Monday night visitations where we're going out to the apartment complexes or whatever, knocking on doors. So we did it all. And I am, I am thankful that my parents had me in church from an early age. But I will tell you that there are some things that I grew up, I feel like, that I learned uh, wrong about Jesus. And, and some things that I didn't even learn ever at all. And so kind of some general thoughts that I had as I grew up, some general kind of ideas that I had about church was, one, I believed that the Old Testament was about God the Father. I was taught to believe that the New Testament is about Jesus. And I was taught to believe that Jesus... Is, uh, is our sacrifice for sin. And those are all okay things, I guess. But the Old Testament's also about Jesus, and the New Testament's also about God the Father. And Jesus isn't just our Savior. I was kind of taught Jesus as a very one-dimensional idea, that Jesus died for your sins so that you wouldn't go to hell and that you could go to heaven. And that's kind of what I was taught about Christ. But today, we want to round that picture out a little bit more. And I would encourage those of you who have children at home that are still under your tutelage that you, uh, that you shape for them a more holistic view of Jesus, that you, that you round Jesus out. He's not just a savior, but he's also a shepherd and a king. And that's what we want to look at today. We're going to look at two Old Testament prophecies that are quoted for us in the New Testament. We're going to kind of springboard off of those to accomplish a couple of ideas. If you are looking towards the new year, it's just a few weeks away, and you're thinking, one of the things that I want to do, I want to get a new Bible, I want to, I want to read through the Bible this next year, I want to mark some things up, I, I might encourage you this year to try the new English translation, the Net Bible, if you haven't tried that yet. It's a pretty decent translation, but here's what I think you will love about it, one of my favorite things about it, is that all the places in the New Testament where it quotes the Old Testament, it has those quotes in bold, so that you know, oh, this is an Old Testament quote. And any place where it references the Old Testament, not a direct quote, but a reference to the Old Testament, it puts those in italics so that you can see how much of the New Testament uses the Old Testament. And that's not something that we can normally do unless we know the Old Testament very, very well, or unless somebody has pointed all those things out to us. And so the Net Bible is a very helpful way to read through it and go, oh, this is a quote from the Old Testament, or this is a reference to the Old Testament. That being said, Micah 5, beginning in verse 1, says this. This is a prophecy of the coming Christ, and it says, Now muster your troops, O daughters of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. Verse 2, listen carefully. But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be named among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until that time when she who is in labor has given birth, and the rest of his brothers will remain to the people, will return. Sorry, to the people of Israel. And then pay attention to verse 4. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of his Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will dwell secure, for now he will be great to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. I want to focus here on verse 2 and verse 4, and then the very beginning of verse 5. You, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel. And listen to this phrase whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient 
of days. I love that line. Here is a prophecy about a coming king whose origin is in ancient of days. I don't know a lot about uh, my last name, the Dalglish. Uh, the, the few things that I know about it have, have not been beautiful things. I worked at a coffee shop when I was 24, 1999, and somebody came to me and said, man, you have a fascinating last name. I'm going to do some research for you. They brought me a couple of weeks later a one-page printout, and everything that they had found about the Dalglishes was that we were thieves and murderers and always trying to overthrow the government. Uh, and, and so uh, that was interesting. Uh, I have, I have, uh, I got, of course, my name from my father. He has two brothers, but they only had daughters. I know about my grandfather, Roy Douglas, who fought in World War II. I have his Purple Heart and his Silver Star, a letter of commendation from a general. I have his bayonet knife and his compass that he used in the war, and that's about all I have of that. But I can't go any further back than that. My youngest sister has started to do some kind of genealogical study on our family. There were, it turns out, a couple of Douglas preachers in the 1800s, so I'm not the first one. I'm definitely the first one in recent years uh, because... We weren't great recently, and, uh, and so is a nice way to say that. And so when I got married, my dad's brothers uh, had only daughters. When I got married, I had two sons, and so now the Douglas name continues, and periodically I think about what it will be like if they have kids, and then those kids have kids, and I get to be a grandfather and a great-grandfather, and I think of my family line being a representation of Jesus. That's what I think about. I think about that progressing forward. But here's what I want you to know. When I think about my family line and I think about my kids growing up and getting married one day and having kids and then those kids having kids, that's future, but it's not kids that are from of old. It's not kids that are of from ancient days. It's just kids. And the promise of Micah is that somewhere down the line of King David, somewhere down the line of King David is going to be a descendant who will shepherd Israel, whose origin is from ancient of days which is such a cool thing. So he's going to come, Christ, the Savior, is going to come down here, but his beginning is here in the ancient of days. That's why John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus has always been. Jesus has always existed. He is the creator of the world, the creator of the universe. He was there in Genesis 1 when all things were spoken into existence. So this ruler who is going to come and shepherd his people actually is from ancient of days. And I think that's amazing. It says in verse 4, He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will dwell secure, for he will be great to the ends of the earth, and there shall be peace. So Christ is going to come as a shepherd, as a ruler over the people, a shepherd of the people, and in that, there is peace. This is a quote, by the way, this Micah text here is quoted for us in Matthew 2. This is a text you're very familiar with this time of year. We talk about this text all the time. Matthew 2, beginning in verse 1, says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there were wise men from the east who came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? We'll revisit that in a moment. For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem along with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written in the prophet. And he's going to quote Micah 5, 2 and 4. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. What does it mean for us that Jesus is the shepherd of his people? What does it mean that Jesus is a shepherd? Well, there's a couple of things here. I won't re-preach this message. I preached it this past summer. It's still, uh, you can go to our podcast and find it there. But in John 10, Jesus says, he calls himself the good shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I have come, and he says in John 10, 14 through 16, he says, the shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He goes, I have come to call all of my sheep together. Now, this is a beautiful thing, and, and I would love uh, nothing more than to talk to you more about this in great detail. Like if you, you could go listen to the sermon, but it would make me really happy if you just text me or call me later and go, hey, I have some questions about that because... These are my favorite things to discuss. We just can't go into great detail right now. But listen, in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, there are two prophecies about the coming Savior calling him the good shepherd. Okay, two prophecies, one in Jeremiah, one in Ezekiel. Now, the good shepherd is in contrast to the people of the day in Jeremiah's day and Ezekiel's day. Jeremiah and Ezekiel were contemporaries, two different prophets, but prophesying at the same time. Okay. 
And so they say right now the leaders over Israel are wicked shepherds. They don't take care of the sheep. They're not taking care of the people. They're not finding the lost. They're not binding up the broken. They're not healing the sick. The shepherds over my people right now are wicked, but he promises, God promises through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, I will bring you a good shepherd who will seek for the lost sheep who will heal the sick sheep, who will bind up the broken sheep and feed the hungry sheep. He's going to take care of the sheep. So the Jews were looking for a Savior who would come and take care of them, who would come and minister to their needs and take care of them. And so when Jesus, standing in front of a group of Jews, says, I'm the good shepherd, when he says, I'm the good shepherd, he is saying, I fulfill that prophecy. I am the shepherd who came to take care of you and to meet your needs. The Bible says in Peter, 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, cast your cares upon God because he cares for you. And I think that sometimes it's really hard for us to imagine that this great God Almighty, God in heaven, cares about us. But he does. He cares about you. He cares that you know him. He cares that your needs are met. He cares about you. And Jesus is this great and beautiful shepherd whose aim it is is to find the lost sheep, Bind up the broken sheep, feed the hungry sheep, take care of the hurt sheep. God wants to meet your needs. He wants to take care of you. He wants to love you and show and lavish love on you. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, Jesus is looking at a group of Jews, a crowd that's gathered around him. And the Bible says that he was filled with such compassion because they looked like sheep without a shepherd. He came to be the shepherd. He came to give direction to our lives that seem broken and hurt. Probably the most well-known text in the Bible about God, Jesus, being a shepherd is the 23rd Psalm, which starts off this way. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. He goes, and and the last line, oh my goodness, the last line of the 23rd Psalm says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This idea that Jesus, our shepherd, he cares for us. I don't know if you grew up in in kind of like a fundamentalist Baptist church like I did, but I grew up believing that Jesus probably didn't care about me a whole lot. I grew up believing that he was kind of hard sometimes. But Jesus is a shepherd of our souls. He cares for us. He's called by Peter, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, the caregiver of our souls. I've heard people ask before this time of year, they make whole sermons about it. I won't do that, I don't think, today. But they they asked this question, why was it that the very first people to hear about Jesus were shepherds in Luke 2? The very first people to be told about the birth of Jesus were shepherds. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2, they were keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel appeared to them and then a host of angels declaring, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. This day in Bethlehem has a Savior been born and the shepherds leave their sheep and they go and they find Jesus lying in a feeding trough. I always thought the manger was the building. The manger is the feeding trough. Anybody else like thought it was the building? Anybody? Four of us, okay. Uh, So the rest of you are geniuses, and we appreciate you not telling us. What's that all about? Why didn't you tell us? You just thought we knew. We're not as smart as you, okay? And so it's the feeding trough of the animals, and Jesus, they found Jesus laid in a manger, and these shepherds come, and they acknowledge him as king. They acknowledge him as the, the savior. But shepherds, why shepherds? Well, who are the other people that were looking for Jesus after he was born? The wise men. We just read this. And who are they looking for? They're looking for a king. And so I think that there's a picture here in the two people who are seeking Jesus out after he's been born, the shepherds and the wise men. They're they're seeking the chief shepherd of their souls. They're seeking the king. There is something significant about this that we need to know and grasp. We need to understand it. It needs to be part of our language with our kids. We need to to shape the language probably for ourselves. We, We need to be able to say to one another like, Jesus isn't just my savior, he's my shepherd and he's my king. See, if you'll roll with me over to Isaiah chapter 9, let's look at him being a king for a moment. Isaiah 9, again, a very popular Christmas text, super, super popular Christmas text. Uh, Verse 6 of Isaiah 9 says, for unto us a child is born. You're like, oh yeah, Jesus, Christmas text. Let's read Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Now, if you're going, who are Zebulun and Naphtali? Uh, Israel, the man Israel, had 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. Two of those 12 tribes 
are Zebulun and Naphtali. Okay, two of the 12 tribes, Zebulun and Naphtali. You don't have to know much more than that for it to make sense for you right now. But it says that he brought these lands into contempt. These lands, Zebulun and Naphtali, were not the premier lands of Israel. These were not the best lands. These were not the best tribes. These were not the best clans of people. And it says, but in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, listen, the Galilee of the nations, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness on them a light has shown. On them a light has shown. So he says these, these nations, Zebulun and Naphtali, they were in contempt. They weren't known for anything, but in the last days by the Jordan, in the region of, the Gal- of Galilee, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has dawned. I'm going to come right back to that text, but let me read you this from Matthew 4. Matthew 4, beginning in verse 12, says this. Now, when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he went and he lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah would be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles, those people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light and those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death on them, a light has dawned. So that's quoted in Matthew four about Jesus. So Micah five quoted in Matthew two, Isaiah nine quoted in Matthew four, both pertaining to Christ. Now let's, let's pick up again in Isaiah nine, two, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness on them, a light has shown you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, and they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. Every boot of the tramping warrior in the battle of tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. And here it is. Listen very carefully. For unto us a child is born, Jesus. To us, a son is given, Jesus, and the government shall be upon his, Jesus' shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his, Jesus' government, and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal, the passion of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So here's this prophecy of, of a... A man who will be born, who is from ancient of days, a man who will be born, who will rule forever, and his kingdom will continue to increase, and his kingdom will have no end. So Malachi says that this one was born of the ancient of days, and then Isaiah says, and his kingdom has no end. So he's from eternity past, he goes into, reaches into eternity forward, and of his kingdom there is no end. He is shepherd, and he is king. We just read it a moment ago in Matthew chapter 2. We saw that the wise men came and they said, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? Just a side note, it never says that there were three wise men. Okay, So if you want to bust some more out with your nativity scene, you'll be totally good to do so. You're like, man, I really found these wise men that I really like, but I've already got three. It's okay. Add more. right? The Bible says all the wise men of the east showed up. Okay, They also don't show up. I've told this every year. I'll tell you now. They also don't show up till six months to two years later. So leave them down the hall. And bring them out in July. Say, I want to be biblically accurate, you know? You got to get rid of the sheep and the goats at that point, get rid of the manger, put Mary and Joseph in a little house, and now the wise men have shown up. And people are like, what are you doing? Are you celebrating Christmas in July? No, no, no. This is biblically, historically accurate. This is when the wise men would have shown up. It'll be a lot of fun. It can be a whole thing for the kids every day. Did you move the wise men? We got to go another centimeter, you know? <laughs> Guests come over, and there's just wise men in the hall on the floor. And they're like, what are these here for? They're making their way to Jesus. So uh, these wise men come to see a king. They come to find King Jesus. Jesus is king. There's no doubt about it. it. Whether you want him to be king or not, Jesus is king. He is God. He is Lord. He is the creator and maker of all things. The, the Bible expresses Jesus as king. And if you're, if you're like... Like man, I have this hard. I have a hard time kind of like marrying these ideas of shepherd and king. Then it should be a little bit made a little bit easier for us because one of the most popular characters in the Bible outside of Jesus is David, and King David was first what? A shepherd, right? He was first a shepherd. When God sent Samuel to anoint David in 1 Samuel 16, David was a keeper of the sheep. That's what he was. When he first kind of did anything of any kind of great recognition in 1 Samuel 17 when he slayed Goliath. 
uh, King Saul, who was the first king of Israel, the king that the people wanted, and then King David was the second king, the king that God wanted for Israel. And, and he, he sees the Philistine giant, uh, Goliath, standing across the field, and he says, I'll go and defeat this giant. He goes, it'll be like when I was a shepherd and I, a bear or a lion came to destroy the sheep and I killed the bear and the lion and I protected the sheep. It'll, it'll be just like that. And so David goes out and he kills Goliath. We talked about that a little bit last week. He kills Goliath and then all the people say, oh, Hosanna, look, he's the king. They start proclaiming David as king. He's not king yet. They start proclaiming and attributing to him kingship. King Saul gets jealous of him and says, man, now the kingdom's going to be his too. And so he tried to kill David. But here's what's interesting. David is shepherd and king. Christ is shepherd and king. I think if I asked you guys, do you believe that Christ is the sacrifice for our sins? Most of us would have language that we could talk about that would say, yes, I believe that Christ is the sacrifice for our sins. I believe that his shed blood on the cross is for my forgiveness. I believe that his resurrection from the, from the dead made me righteous. But I don't know that many of us talk about him as shepherd or king. See, Revelation chapter 19 says that one day he will return at the, voice of the, uh, at the voice of the archangel with the sound of the trumpet. He will return and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess before him and declare him to be king, to declare him to be God. And we see here in Isaiah that there will be no end of his government. There will be no end of his kingdom. In fact, in Daniel chapter 7, there's a prophecy of Christ that corresponds to Revelation 19 and 20. And in Daniel chapter 7, it says that the ancient of days, it says that the son of man came up to the ancient of days, stood before for him and God gave to him a kingdom that is above every kingdom, a kingdom that will have no end, and put on him the crowns of all the kingdoms of the earth and subdued all the other rulers. Here's what I think we've done wrong in church I think we tell people, Come to a savior. I think we do that. Hey, are you a sinner? We try to make it really clear to people that they're a sinner. You know, you have people out there that just want to like be like, Man, you're a wicked sinner. Have you ever considered that? And you're just like, Wow, that's a great approach. Thank you for that. You know, the people who are just like, have you ever considered how repugnant before God you must be? Have you ever considered that you're a vile, vile? Like, come on, that's not even the approach of the scripture, by the way. But people will do that, and they'll say, I want you to see how filthy you are. And they're like, I am filthy. What do I do about it? And they're like, it's a good thing Jesus is a savior. And that's all we teach people. We say, come to Jesus, ask for your sins to be forgiven so that you can be righteous and holy, so that you, can't, you won't be evil in his sight anymore. And that's how we teach Jesus. And it's so short-sighted. Because he is also your shepherd. He cares for you. He cares for you. You matter to the God of heaven. You matter to Christ, the Savior of mankind. But he's also your king. Don't think that when you put faith in Jesus, you put faith in Jesus to do whatever you wanted to do. The moment you put faith in Jesus, you belong to the kingdom of Jesus. You, you don't, you're not a sovereign citizen. You belong to the kingdom of God. You belong to Christ. Yesterday morning, we got up early, and, and our son had to be at school at 6.15 for a basketball tournament in Sonora. And, uh, and then we got ready, and we were shortly behind him, and we were on the road by 6.40. And it, you could tell it was going to be a clear morning. It was, the sun was just beginning to kind of lighten up the sky. The sun hadn't even crested yet. But you could see that there weren't any clouds in the sky, and it was just kind of this beautiful, like, pink bleeding into the black of night, you know? But one of my favorite things, one of my absolute favorite things is West Texas thunderstorms like that just roll up on you in like an hour. You know, when you go outside, it's like 90 degrees, 100 degrees, and then the wind changes direction, and it's like 40 miles an hour, and the temperature just drops like 30 degrees in the space of an hour, and you see this big thunderhead rolling in. I love it. I love it. I should have known that the girl I dated before Michelle was not going to be my wife because she was scared of thunderstorms, and I just should have known then it wasn't going to work. Because, man, I, I love a big thunderstorm. I love it when it just rattles the house. Now, the Bible says that one day Christ will come. This is Revelation 19, that Christ will come on the clouds with glory. So if you would indulge me for just a moment, quit looking at me, just close your eyes and just listen and really focus on this and picture this in your head. But I'm going to, if, you, if you're okay with it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it like a West Texas sky. And the wind shifts direction and the temperature drops and the clouds begin to roll in. In the distance, they're huge. They feel like they're just stacked up for a mile high. And the thunderhead comes in, and it gets grayer and grayer, this kind of bluey, purpley gray, you know? The whole earth now is covered in shadow. And then you hear the voice of an archangel. I have no idea what that sounds like. I can't even begin to guess. 
and you hear the sound of a trumpet. And we faithful followers of Jesus, our eyes are turned skyward as the clouds erupt and are ripped to pieces at the glory of Jesus, and he makes his appearance. The Bible says that his eyes are like torches of fire. Really think about that for a moment. Think of the last time you sat next to the fireplace or you were outside and you had a bonfire going. Think of the red coals of the logs as you watched them being consumed by the flame. His eyes are like torches of fire. It says his face is as brilliant as the sun on a clear day. You're looking into the face of Jesus, bright and shining like the sun, piercing through the clouds. Upon his head are all the crowns of the kingdoms of the earth. Every other ruler, every other authority is about to be brought to nothing. And here the ruler, the king of all kings, comes and makes his appearance known. It says that in his right hand is a rod of iron to rule the nations out of his mouth, a double-edged sword. He rides a white horse and wears a robe that's been dipped in blood. On his thigh is written king of kings and lord of lords, and the entire hosts of the armies of heaven are at his heels cascading across the sky. And though that's where Revelation 19 ends the picture, I want you to, in your imagination, bring that whole entire assembly down to the earth. Allow the hooves of every horse to stir up the dirt of this West Texas territory. Think for a moment of Revelation 5, Revelation 7. Think for a moment where the scripture says that every tribe and every tongue and every nation will be gathered to Christ. And imagine if you would, almost in a comical kind of cartoon way, shrink the earth down just small enough where all the hordes, all the people, all the nations of the earth can walk around the corners of the globe and come into the presence of the living God and gather at his feet. Philippians 2 teaches us that every knee will bow. So imagine as the crowds gather around Christ Every knee compelled, compelled by the force and the beauty and the gravitude of this moment. Every knee bent to the earth, every nose touching the ground. Then it says, and every tongue will confess that he is God, that he is king. Imagine every voice speaking out, worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb. It's not just your voice. It's a myriad of voices, thousands upon thousands, millions upon millions of voices, cascading the glory of God, shouting it back to him. In that moment, not a single bit of ego remains in your heart at that moment. Not a single bit of pride at that moment. Not a single bit uh, of, of wanting to elevate yourself or think more highly of yourself. In that moment, all you can see is the king of glory. That's Jesus, our king. That event is a certain reality. It is, it, it is certain. It will absolutely happen, and there's nothing that we can do to stay it. And I just wonder, I wonder, I wonder if we're aware now that we are part of a kingdom of God. We are part of his kingdom. We serve a king, a resurrected savior today. We glorify him. We know him now. Now listen to me very carefully. Our application today is this. You find your peace and your security in Christ. Both him as shepherd and Micah and both him and him as king in Isaiah 9 both offer to us peace. We can trust his authority as king. We can trust his care for us as shepherd. But hear me very carefully on this. If you... Forget either one of these two characteristics of Christ. You miss the beauty of Christ. If you forget or abandon either of these two, you miss it. Because if you think of Christ only as king, eventually you're going to end up with a thought process of he's a tyrannical leader. He tells me what I need to do. He tells me where I need to be. He tells me to submit to him. He tells me to obey him, which is true. Your life doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs to the king. There is obedience that has merited him. There is obedience that is owed him. There is obedience that is due him. And if you only think of him as king, you're going, he's tyrannical. How dare he tell me who I need to be? And so we bring in shepherd. And we say, oh, he's not a tyrannical leader. He is king, but he is a king who nurtures and a king who binds up and a king who heals and a king who seeks and a king who nourishes But what if you go the other way? What if you focus only on him as shepherd? Oh, man, God is good. 
He will care for you. He will nurture you. He will take care of you and minister to your needs. And you know what? He's a shepherd. You don't owe him anything. And suddenly you begin to think too soft of your view of Christ. You don't feel like you owe him allegiance. You don't feel like you owe him obedience because he's just the shepherd. He's doing what he's supposed to do. His job is to care for me. And so if you do either of these with the exclusion of the other, you miss Christ. I am grateful for his compassion and his kindness to me. I am grateful that he binds up the brokenhearted. I am grateful that he shines like a light into the darkness of my heart and reveals all the things that do not line up with him. I am grateful for that. And I am also grateful that he is king, that we are in his kingdom, part of his government, and I will bring my life in subjugation to him because he's a trustworthy king. Both married together into one thought. I'm not fearful of the king because he's a shepherd. I won't take advantage of the shepherd because he's also a king. I don't think lightly of my king just because he's a shepherd. I don't think wickedly of my shepherd just because he's a king. Those two things intertwine so much so that they can't be broken. He is my sovereign God. And when my eyes behold him, my knees will bend and my tongue will confess. And it won't even be voluntary. It'll just be compelled upon me by God's presence. And there won't be a moment of fear or trepidation or anxiety because I will also see that he is my shepherd whose care is for me. Both together. You who have children at home, don't miss the opportunity to share with them that Christ is their shepherd and their king. Don't paint him one-dimensionally and say he's just a savior. He is our shepherd. What does that mean, mom? What does that mean, dad? It means that he cares for you. He nurtures you. He guards you and protects you and keeps you. But he's also your king. What does that mean, mom? What does that mean, dad? It means we submit ourselves to him. We obey him. We proclaim his kingdom, not ours. He's both. And that brings us to our prayer today, which is this. God, we thank you for Jesus who has shone into the darkness and comforted us like a shepherd and led us like a king. We thank God that he's shone into the darkness of our hearts, comforted us like a shepherd, and that he led us like a king. Would you take a moment to pray that where you're seated? God, we thank you and we praise you for the great care that you have shown us. We thank you that Jesus Christ is our Savior, that in him there is forgiveness of sins, that in him there is righteousness, in him there is holiness, in him there is adoption into your family. But God, we also thank you that he is our shepherd, that he cares for us, that he loves us and nurtures us. And we thank you, God, that he's our king that whatever this world does, whatever this world offers for all of its failures and all of its weakness and all of its sin, that we are part of the kingdom of heaven and we serve a king that cannot be overthrown, that cannot be undone, whose kingdom has no end. We serve him who is born of the ancient of, or exists from the ancient of days, born to be king and shepherd of our souls. And God, we, we, with our minds today, join with those saints in the last days who will gather around the throne of Christ. with the 24 elders falling down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sing a new song and we know that one day we will join with them and we will proclaim, worthy are you to take the scroll, to open its seals for you were slain. By your blood, you have ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. And they will say, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever.